repertoire, two new pies for the repertoire this year, a pecan pie yeah. and a banana cream. The winning, the winning person gets a pie. That too. The key is the key is to attend all these and do the quiz. That's the key to winning the pie. So is everybody done? Pretty much. Brad, are you done? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Okay. So um, I hope everybody either read a lecture, uh, read the uh, focus points focal points or uh, watched Brad's lecture because um, that helps you understand what I'm going to be talking about. These are not the these are not just a general headache. This is not a general headache case. This is talking about some of the atypical headache patients and every one of the patients that I'm presenting here came into neuroophthalmology. So these are not like uh, neurology cases or anything like that. It looks like I'm going to have to use this. So I'm going to start with this for, and I sent you the cases ahead of time too, so that you could think about them. Um, uh, so we're going to just kind of go through. I've got quite a few. I don't know how many we'll get through, and we'll leave a few minutes at the end to talk about the quiz. So um, this is a 22-year-old man who has pain over his left eye, and during the episode, he notices that he has a little ptosis and tearing, and the pain lasts 30 to 45 minutes. He feels like he needs to pace, and sometimes it awakens him at night, and his exam is normal except for this. <coughs> okay, and I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, you can see it pretty well. Anybody want to say what's going on with his exam? Okay, and uh, okay, so what do you think that is? Horners. Horners. All right, and um, so uh, let's just talk about what what is in your uh, differential diagnosis, uh, first of all. What, cluster. What's cluster. Is there anything else, or are you going to just say cluster? I need like, a <laughs> try general any one of the trigeminal autonomic cephalgias, and and, um, and can you name all of them? Um, I'm not sure, like sunked, hemicrania, continua, and paroxysmal hemicrania. Good, good, that's good. If you know those, that's really good. And uh, so so that's your, cluster's your number one, but it could be one of the other trigeminal autonomic cephalgias. Um, do you need to evaluate this? Do you need to scan this person? This person's never had any imaging. And you're saying yes, you do. Why do you need to scan him? Um, so, I guess, well, when he has a Horner's, so um, a Horner's syndrome, and it is associated with a headache, so you worry about um, a, a carotid uh, dissection. Okay. Um, maybe his pain is not actually from a headache syndrome, maybe it's from like a dissection, even though he's a younger patient. Okay. Yeah. The, the ta in general, the tacks are the ones that you have to scan. All right, and then what would you do for treatment? With the what are the ones? We have to the tax, the trigeminal autonomic cephalgia. Oh. You know, migraine. Tax. You can do a. You can see a hundred patients with migraine, and if they have a completely normal exam, one or two of them will have something funny on their MR, or maybe more. But most of them are not going to be relevant. The rest, you know, like ten percent may have some weird thing, but only one or two will be relevant. But a tax. If you take 100 people with one of the trigeminal autonomic cephalgias of any flavor that you uh, discuss, you listed, you've got a 30 to 40 percent ch chance of finding something secondary. So it's a much higher yield uh, for imaging. And so the first time you see somebody with one of these, you do have to image them. What would be the scan of choice? Are you MR. 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 In general, all headache types of any kind, except for sudden onset of the worst headache of your life that could be an aneurysm, rupture, hemorrhage, it's an MR. And in Choosing Wisely, you know the Choosing Wisely campaign where they were trying to give you three things to remember to choose wisely about well, in headache, one of them is don't image with an MR. If you need to image, get an MRI scan, except for acute hemorrhage. 
And then treatment. Um, I know you won't get into treatment, but you should at le least know something about treatment. Oxygen, Oxygen for the acute cluster, and um, and you can because they're so brief, you could use injectable sumatriptan or imatrix. <coughs> and then uh, <coughs> preventatively, uh, there's some prevention out there of rapamil, um, and uh, the new um, calcitonin gene related peptide. Antibodies, uh, emgality or uh, galcanizumab has been approved for cluster. All right, I just wanted, if, if you didn't remember about the different tacks, um, I just wanted to remind you that the cluster is in that 45 minutes to a couple hours. Uh, and most of these are by, the longer the name, the, the shorter the headache. So, <laughs> like soaked, short, you know, lateral neuralgia form with conjunctival ejection and tearing is two to 10 seconds, very brief. Episodic hemicrania continua, uh, it can be brief, but hemicrania continua is continuous. And then paroxysmal hemicrania is a little bit uh, longer than uh, uh, episodic hemicrania. All right, good, good job. So next case, and all these are from my clinic, okay? 84-year-old physician, family history of migraine, <clears throat> had migraine in uh, his 20s intermittently. In fact, we saw somebody somewhat like this yesterday. Uh, and in his 40s, he had migraine aura without headache. And the aura was a visual scintillating scotoma, sometimes fortification spectra. He could draw out a zigzaggy line uh, for 20 minutes. And every once in a while, when the aura was off to the right, he would have speech difficulty, word finding difficulty, mild headache, rarely, occasionally, and sometimes the speech problem would last 30 minutes or so, but it was never severe. He was sitting in a boardroom. Um, he's on a lot of boards because he's retired, uh, and uh, he couldn't understand the slides, so he got up to leave, and he wanted to tell them that he was wanted to leave or he was going to leave because he didn't feel well, but he couldn't get his words out. This lasted three to four hours. He had no headache. He had another spell a week later. He was hospitalized. He had an MR. This was negative. He had a little slowing of his EEG. He does have a lot of past medical history, AFib, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, gout, and a little peripheral neuropathy. So what is his diagnosis? Migraine. OK, so but what, what is what kind of what kind of migraine? Complex migraine with aura without headache. Okay, so it's it's migraine aura without headache. Okay, and um, does anybody know why somebody older would be getting this? No, I think we saw a patient yesterday or older yeah. or whatever who, who would have grown the pain of the migraines but continued to have aura. Right. So I think you mentioned that that's a can be seen. Exactly, late onset yeah. migraine, so uh, uh, aura. So C. Miller Fisher wrote about this, and it's um, uh, it happens in, in individuals as they get older, they get the aura and they don't have the headache. Um, and so this was aura without headache. Uh, and there is a form of this called, uh, which is typical aura, and no headache follows it. Um, and this was a wonderful review, I don't know if any of you were around when um, uh, we had a visiting doctor from Thailand who wrote this paper up, that uh, these migraine accompaniments, so people can come in with a history of aura, they used to get migraine and now they get aura and they don't get the headache. And, um, and most of these are visual, 23%. Sometimes blindness, like losing vision in one eye, uh, homonymous hemianopia, blurred vision, trouble focusing, but I wanted you to note that, you know, 12% can have visual and speech disturbances. And obviously, in brainstem symptoms, that would be like diplopia and vertigo with the aura. I wanted to bring this up to you because a lot of people come in with this when they get older. And the question is to ask, did you ever have migraine when you were younger? You do have to work these up. I mean, this isn't a headache type that you can just... Um, uh, you know, just say, oh well, it's probably aura, a late onset aura. He needed an MR, he got a full evaluation on the neurology service, uh, but it is, it is something to be aware of. 
And there is a uh, sub-variety of this called late onset migraine accompaniments or LOMA. Uh, and most of these are visual, but they can have speech in up to a third. And the big difference is you have to tell it apart from a transient ischemic attack. So can somebody tell me how do you tell a difference between migraine and a TIA? Wake up. I'm not awake in the morning, so you, you guys should be. I've got my... responsible vascular distribution. Okay, so how, what is the onset of a TIA? Sudden. 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 What's the onset of a migraine? Sudden. Okay, it's kind of slow. It starts in the center and it moves out. There's a movement that comes with it, right? And that's really a critical piece of information. Um, and then uh, the duration. What about the duration of a TIA? Sure. It's about an hour. It could be up to an hour. What's the duration of an aura? It could be up to an hour. So that duration doesn't help you very much. Um, uh, TIAs can be brief, like totally brief. Uh, aura usually has a buildup and it goes over time. Um, and auras often will be accompanied by other symptoms of migraine. What are the other symptoms of migraine? Mm -hmm. Photophobia, phonophobia, maybe nausea, maybe cloudy thinking. A TIA usually doesn't have the cloudy thinking. Migraine is usually a positive phenomenon, meaning that it's going to be white or sparkly or uh, whereas what is the TIA? It's going to be a loss of function, right? It's going to be like either weakness or blindness. You're going to have an amaurosis fugax with a blindness over one eye, right? This is critical, though. You have to know the difference between a TIA and a migraine and uh, because, I mean, they will come into the ophthalmology clinic and... And, but migraine can be associated with the speech and motor and uh, sensory. That's why you have to spend a few more seconds uh, getting a little bit more history out of somebody uh, before you just say, oh, well, that's a migraine. And I always work these auras without headache and these older people up because there can be other things. Like um, you can have a migraine phenomenon coming from a tumor, for example. Uh, or uh, a, um, a, a occipital lobe seizure. Okay, usually those are um, uh, usually associated with movement or some kind of kaleidoscopic movement in the field, and it doesn't sound like the typical aura, you know, with the little onset in the center moving out or onset outside moving in. Have, has anybody ever had an aura? I've had one. It's pretty amazing, right? And you look at it, and, you, and the other thing about auras is everybody thinks it's in one eye. And of course, you know, because it looks like it's in one eye, right? But if you cover each eye, that person's page can still, you can still see the aura <coughs> on the page even if you cover up the eye. So it's always, in, it's usually in both eyes. And when you, when you say work up the aura, do you get an MR brain and EEG on, them, on these patients? I would get an MR for sure. This guy needed an MR to rule out any kind of stroke because of that prolonged, remember I said this went on for hours and um, lasted a long time. So absolutely that person needs a workup with an MR. Now a typical aura without a headache in somebody who's had previous migraine without anything else on their exam, I would, I would. Um, unless there's something funny. All right, so, um, 39-year-old woman, sudden onset, almost explosive pain behind her head, in, behind her eyes and in her head. She was diagnosed with migraine. She went to the emergency room, and the CT was negative, and it got better out over a couple days, but four days later, she had another explosive headache. She has mild photophobia. She has previous migraine. So... Uh, I, I'm putting down a differential diagnosis. What, what, what kinds of things would be most likely in this situation? Primary thunderclap headache could be a possibility as well. Primary thunderclap headache. Um, well, it is a thunderclap headache. Okay, but but. Uh, um, 
-hmm. It could be yeah. primary, could just be a simple primary thunderclap headache. They do reverse IBS based on her age. But this is kind of the aneurysm, benign is exertional orgasmic headache. So uh, orgasmic headache is usually seen in men, often middle-aged men, uh, at, at uh, orgasm, and then they get this sudden onset of the worst headache of their life. Um, reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome, RCVS, is pretty common. Um, and uh, this is characterized by recurrent thunderclap onset, sudden onset of the worst headache of one's life. Uh, obviously, aneurysm is always at the top of somebody's mind uh, with somebody with that. Uh, press, posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. Usually that's seen with hypertension, eclampsia, uh, this is kind of atypical for migraine. And then um, sometimes you can get headaches with a drug use, and probably that's related to the RCVS, like pseudoephedrine, cocaine, marijuana. Marijuana can cause this uh, thunderclap onset headache. Um, and, uh, and I even saw somebody who was doing those um, jolt shots, or, or no, what are those, are those energy drinks, you know, the whatever they're called. Five hour yeah, like that, that five hour or whatever it is. Anyway, they were doing those and they got one of these. So uh, the evaluation is imaging. You got to image these people. And um, so there are primary thunderclap headaches like benign exertional headaches, cough headache, exertional, orgasmic. And then you can just see the big long list of secondary. These headaches are ones you don't take. You call up your neurology colleagues and say, I'm going to, you guys work this up. And then if they still have eye pain, send it back to me. <laughs> <laughs> but I want you to recognize this one as not something that you just sit there and go, oh, that's interesting. Wow, yeah. No, you call up your neurology colleagues and let them work them up. Okay. And especially if it's rep repetitive, uh, you know, thunderclap onset headaches. Um, but because there's a whole bunch of these things. And why would pituitary tumor be on the list? Apoplexy, right. And th that's another cause of a thunderclap onset headache. Any question about this one? Okay, this is another patient we had in, um, in clinic. 18-year-old, senior high school, strong family history of migraine, mother and sister. He used to get a few headaches. He'd take an acetaminophen and lay down and rest, and he was fine. Uh, but after a usual weightlifting exercise, he had tingling in his body, chest, arms, couldn't speak for 30 minutes, fell asleep. His mother, of course, wigged out and <coughs> took him to the ER, and he had a CT scan that was normal. And he was pretty normal, so they left to go home. But on the way home, he couldn't speak anymore, so he got back to the emergency room, um, and they did TPA on him. Um, oh. And uh, he had a normal MR, normal TTE with bubble. He did get a very bad headache afterwards, and he was just diagnosed with complicated migraine. Now, there's no such diagnosis as complicated migraine in the International Classification of Headache Disorders. So this would be migraine with aura uh, um, if it were a migraine. So, um, so they, his primary care put him on amitriptyline. Um, he had a third aphasic episode and a horrible headache. He was given codeine and butelbital, and then he was sent to ophthalmology, and he was found to have disc swelling. He had an elevated opening pressure, and he had 112 white cells. He was started on acetazolamide for the pressure, then he got a post-LP headache, a blood patch, and he was started on topiramate. Does this sound like a neuro-ophthalmology case or what? <laughs> and then this is his exam and neuro -op. So then we saw him. I don't know, which, which one of you guys saw this guy? Rachel, okay. So Rachel, you can't tell everybody what's going on. Uh, so this, uh, he was 20-30 in the right eye, 20-60 in the left. He had no APD. His fields were really normal except for the big blind spot. And he had a big esotropia uh, because he had bilateral six nerve palsies. So this was his workup. Um, he had a positive RPR, but he was seen by an infectious disease that was false positive, a negative FDA, and he had a big, big workup. He did have a positive ANA, and he had all those white cells and elevated protein. 
and all the meds were stopped. He got new glasses. And so anybody have a thought about this case? What's handle? The headache. <laughs> was it headache with neurologic deficits and CSF, lymphocytes, or lymphocytosis? Yep. Uh, <laughs> no, it could be something else. It could be something else. I mean, he could have just have had an encephalitis or a, a meningitis. His red count on the CSF. That white count can be, that can no, be. what was his red count, though? Uh, his red count was not that bad, no. Okay. Uh, it, no, he had leukocytosis. He had clearly leukocytosis. What's interesting about this case is, you know, it's migraine-like with these neurologic deficits, and then, um, uh, and then the uh, white count in the CSF, it's almost always over uh, 15. And in his case, it was quite high, and in the literature, it's also quite high. And then the headache comes along with the neurologic deficits, and then you work them up, and you really don't find anything, and um, it goes away. Uh, but what was interesting was that when we looked this up in the literature, papilledema can be present, which my headache colleagues had never heard of papilledema with handle. Uh, so I, this case could be written up, Rachel. Another, I'm another. Another case to write up, right? 90% uh, of pressure is over 400. Tell. I'll give you a great differential when you ask us. <laughs> and sometimes they have a viral prodrome. Their MRs are usually normal, and everything gets done, and everything is normal. But it's uh, it's something to be aware of, and it was listed in your focal points, right? Wasn't it? Very in, yeah, it mentioned in focal points. So I figured you might get one right on the on the OCAP exam with the handle. All right, so they'll, uh, this person is a 15-year-old sophomore in high school, um, and a year, she had an ear infection when she was really little and lost her hearing. She has a family history of migraine, and she came in uh, talking about having oscillopsia uh, with intermittent headaches, and, uh, and, and uh, she feels pale, her vision's blurred, sometimes gets double, she sleeps and it goes away. Now, unfortunately, because my thumb drive wasn't even recognized, you know, we have to carry encrypted thumb drives, and if our thumb drives are not encrypted, they could take them away from us. This wouldn't even recognize my thumb drive, but just imagine this kid sitting there going, and her eyes are beating to the right intermittently, and that's what she looks like. And then in between, she's completely normal. So you're seeing her because she's coming in with oscillopsia, uh, kind of these spells. And it isn't that much headache. It's more of this. And it has like an EEG. EEG normal. Oh. Do you have an MRI? MRI normal. <laughs> the, what the, this infection she had was when she was a little kid, she lost her hearing. Her hearing isn't good in the right ear, but that's been evaluated and it's thought to be an idiopathic hearing loss in a childhood. Any changes with position? Pardon? Any changes with position? No, no change with position. And it's only intermittently in, at school. She turns pale. She looks like she this. She gets school. a little bit of double vision and her eyes are beating to the right. Does she have like social problems at school? None. Mm, She's a good student. That's not true. <laughs> Functional paleness <laughs> would be really interesting. Uh, yeah. But her mom brought this video in to show me what she looked like when she was in the middle of this. So I would take it seriously. Was the EEG done when she was having an episode like this? No, it wasn't. But, but um, you know. Well, I bring this one up because we see vertigo in our clinic, right? Uh, because that one of the symptoms of vertigo sometimes is oscillopsia and diplopia. But if you see a kid with vertigo in childhood, there is a benign vertigo of childhood, benign positional vertigo, which was, that Shrav was getting at with, does it change with position, vertiginous migraine, cyclic vertigo, and then uh, migraine with brainstem aura. And yes, you have to, you do work it up. Everything was negative. Now, uh, ben what? Uh, benign paroxysmal vertigo are brief attacks in otherwise ha healthy children, comes on without warning, 
They often have nystagmus, ataxia, vomiting, pallor, fearfulness, and their otherwise normal exam. Um, and uh, there is a relationship between vertiginous migraine and this benign paroxysmal vertigo of childhood. Some people think this benign paroxysmal vertigo is like a precursor, just like car sickness for migraine or cyclic vomiting in children with migraine uh, is a precursor. It's like a, 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 you know, instead of getting migraines, they get abdominal pains or cyclic vomiting or this benign paroxysmal vertigo. So, um, so this is completely separate from BPPV? Like it's positional completely separate from benign positional okay. vertigo. It, you could, you could flip her head around in the clinic all day long and nothing would happen. <laughs> um, and then vestibular migraine, this is not rare. This is probably one of the most common causes of, of vertigo that we see in our clinic is vertiginous migraine. And they almost always have a headache, but the headache does not always have to come with the vertigo. It can be intermittent. Um, and uh, so they often have a headache uh, they uh, most often have photophobia or phonophobia. Sometimes they have an aura, uh, but this vestibular migraine is way more common than <clears throat> thought. I showed this video to three uh, pediatric neurologists uh, who do mi migraine, and um, they all said vertiginous migraine. So important to realize that that, that uh, intermittent nystagmus pallor, photophobia, feeling sick and nauseated, et cetera, that are episodic, could just be vertiginous migraine. But obviously, you have to work it up. How long do those episodes last for? The, these would last, she'd sleep, and then she'd be fine. So she'd go home, go to bed, sleep. And she was getting like one every other week. Um, and I mean, you know, and she was a bright kid. She, it, in between, she looked great. You know, but this is how she looks in the middle of it. She, you can t tell she doesn't feel good. I mean, she's like, ugh, right? <laughs> so. Brainstem, or is that older patients or not? Right. In uh, probably older kids or, or, or older people, or brainstem aura. Now, brainstem aura can be tricky too. Brainstem aura is like an aura. It happens before the headache, and it. But when they say brainstem, they mean things like double vision a uh, little ataxia, um, uh, uh, dizziness, vertigo. I mean, there's a whole list of brainstem symptoms that people can have that often come before the headache occurs. It used to be called basilar migraine, but we don't call it that. Now we call it migraine with brainstem aura. OK, does that? OK, now this one is another one. I don't know who saw this one. Uh, no, this is another one. So 49-year-old woman, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, type 2 diabetes, no previous history of migraine, never had headaches really before. Um, for the last two years, though, she's been having headaches, especially at night, and she noticed her pupil would dilate. And she was diagnosed with migraine. She used uh, acetaminophen. She was having spells once every three to four months. Then they slowly increased to once every two weeks. And then her pupil would come back to normal in between the spells. And sometimes her pupil dilated without a headache that could last minutes to hours. She never had a headache without a dilated pupil, but she could have a dilated pupil without a headache. And she had associated light sensitivity and nausea, severe enough that she had to go lie down. And remember, she's 49. Uh, one day, she left for work. Uh, she left work because she had a fever and a cough. And she had a headache for 44 hours with a red left eye. Then she had wavy colors in her vision, especially when she closed her eyes. Then she went to the ER two days later and was given morphine, which made her throw up and made her headaches actually worse. Morphine is a terrible drug for migraine because it dilates your blood vessels, makes the whole thing worse. Uh, she was admitted to the hospital for pneumonia and treated with antibiotics. She got two shots of sumatriptan and her headache got better, but her pupil enlarged bigger and didn't go down, and her red eye was a little bit better. Now, um, she's got some family history of aneurysm, lung cancer, stroke. She's on, you know, the usual medicines. <laughs> and uh, she has two children. She's been a smoker. She does drink some alcohol. Then 10 days later, she had a seizure. Then her left pupil dilated again, and she was sent to the ER. 
And then they life flighted her to the university because they couldn't find out what was wrong. And she was noted to have ptosis, a midriatic, unreactive pupil on the left. Here's her, here's her MRI scan. Anybody see anything on the MR? That's a problem. What do you see, Rachel? Yeah, this is what you're talking yeah. about, right? Yeah. Or RCVS. So, and do you know what that's kind of associated with? Uh, like RCVS or press. Press, yeah. yeah. Posterior reversible mm -hmm. encephalopathy syndrome was, exactly. The rest of her blood vessels looked pretty good. Uh, her diffusion was basically negative, so she was diagnosed with press. But this is what she looked like. Do you, did anybody here take care of her? Oh, okay. Two of Rachel again. Another case you can write up, Rachel. We had her on the and Kendra. Okay, so Kendra <laughs> saw this patient too. So she had ptosis. She had a little bit of an exo, um, and she was diagnosed with press. And if you looked at her pupil, this is her pupil over here, and you can see a normal pupil here. Okay. Were all her attacks side locked to the left side? Were they all, uh, uh, all the attacks were. Uh, yeah, all the attacks were on the left side. You mean one eye being big or the other eye being yeah, big? Sometimes it can be in one yeah, eye. Yeah, sometimes it can just be one eye. <laughs> no. No, it's it's migraine with well, what what happens with uh, benign episodic medriasis? They get their usual migraine and then they get anisocoria. You don't see that in press, so that something that this is not typical press. So press is usually just seizure and then this mm -hmm. MR finding, and, and it's you don't usually get this kind of thing, uh, dilated pupil. And her evaluation was her vision was down a little bit, um, and you can see that her pupils were terrible. She had an afferent defect in the left by reverse afferent technique. She did have good color vision. Eye movements were grossly full, but she did have this large exophoria. She had one cotton wool spot on the left. So here's her OCT. All right, so here's, so um, I wanted to give you kind of an idea of what should you be thinking about, but I want you to tell me what you think this is. So, uh, straw brings up migraine, uh, benign episodic medriasis of migraine. The neurologist on the ser service thought it was a third nerve palsy with pupil involvement. Uh, the other causes of enlarged pupil could be an 80s pupil, uh, pupillary block, seizure-induced medriasis, um, but, and that was brought up. Could this be seizure-induced medriasis? Because you can see seizures giving induced medriasis. Why would you want to know that? <laughs> Is she, oh, what were her meds? Uh, okay, so her meds, uh, her meds, let's go back to her meds. Okay. Acetaminophen, atorvastatin, estradiol, lisinopril, metformin, triamphrine, aspirin. Okay. <coughs> um, so I'm good, not going to. So she had narrow angles on exam, and her eye pressure was 49. When was that checked? Huh? When was it checked finally? Uh, in our clinic. <laughs> Unfortunately, it hadn't been checked until. And she'd been seen by an ophthalmologist, and she didn't have... In between, when her pupil was normal, she had normal pressure, but when her pupil dilate, dilated, she had that. Um, so um, I bring this case to you for number one. I mean, you're always going to check a pressure no matter what. Even in those little black bags that you carry around, you always have a tonal pen, you check the pressure. But a di I think neurologists need this message, that you got to check. If you could see somebody with a dilated pupil, almost isolated, and a red eye, you've got to check the pressure. So that's really critical. That, But it should be in your thinking. 
and whoever brought up what drug she's on, you should know this list because there are a whole lot of drugs that can cause changes in the angle, especially things like dipyramate, acetazolamide, um, can all change the angle pressure and uh, or uh, angle and give people a uh, closed angle that have got a narrow angle. Um, but I think that was really an instructive case for a lot of people. Um, and you know, benign episodic medriasis often comes with the migraine, and so we you know lowered her pressure. The reason she had press was they stopped all her antihypertensives when they treated her pneumonia in the hospital. Uh, fortunately, she really lost vision related to the uh, angle closure. Um, I was going to show you a nice picture of a person with episodic medriasis with a humongo pupil. Um, well, maybe I'll do that later. I, I may have one for you. Okay, any questions about this one? Just something to always think about those pupils. Check the pressure. Don't forget block. Okay, so 58-year-old woman, and um, she had no previous headaches. And in January, she began with a new dull, continuous right-sided headache around her eye, but she would get these severe, very sharp frontotemporal area uh, stabbing pains radiating to the ear, jaw, and nostril. It would last 10 to 15 minutes, about five times a day. She was light sensitive, mainly in the right eye. She had tearing also on the right side. And here's her exam. And here's an apoclonidine test. And uh, why did we do the apoclonidine test, Mike? Warners. Warners. And can you see what happened here? She has a smaller pupil on the right. And when we put the apoclonidine in, you can see how the right pupil dilated. So the diagnosis is Warners. OK. All right, so what, what do you uh, think we should do here? So what? I, let's first do the headache phenotype. What's the phenotype of this headache? So it's continuous right-sided pain with sharp jabbing pains on top of it, uh, and they would last 10 to 15 minutes on top of a continuous right-sided pain. Mm -hmm. Hemicrania continua. Okay, good. So that's the phenotype of the headache. So what do we have to do about hemicrania continua and all tacks that occur um, like this. Okay, so our next step, what's our next step? Do we want to just give her an endomethacin trial and see if the pain goes away? Uh, get a carotid angiogram, CT, MR? What would you do? MR? Okay. And here's her field. I, I did a field, I chose to do a field. Um, what do you think about the field? I mean, didn't you do fields yesterday? Anybody want to? Come it's on, you guys. Like a it's almost like the junctional fields that we saw yesterday. Because, um, well, no, I guess not. It's what are you going to call this? Completely march out to like a left homonymous hemianopia, but. It's kind of an incongruous yeah. left yeah. homonymous hemianopia. It's not, it, I mean, it's incongruous, right? It's more nasal on the right eye, a little bit of temporal, but there's something going on a little bit up there on the uh, superior nasal quadrant of the left eye, too, correct? Yeah. But, all right, so, but Teresa's already said we have to get a scan. Yeah. Uh, get an MR scan, okay. And uh, what do you think this is going to show? And I, I picked this case for a couple reasons. Well, occipital flow tumors can cause pain around the eye. Mm -hmm. Occipital stroke, mm -hmm. okay. Or sorry, yeah, or stroke. But remember that as, uh, as the a field gets more and more yeah, congruous so in the occipital it's lobe, it's, you know, it's that, those are pretty congruous mm -hmm. in the occipital lobe. You know, so you can have incongruous kind of anywhere uh, anterior to the occipital lobe. What was that? I think that you'll have a cavernous sinus syndrome. 
cavernous sinus syndrome? Well, how are you getting the field defect? Yes. Now get these, these guys over on this table that are sitting here mute. And you have a carotid dissection and uh, have been throwing like embolic stroke. Okay, so a carotid dissection throwing an embolic stroke. And where where is the stroke then? Right parietal. But okay. I, I, I forget which side her. This is the left, left side. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Anybody else have other thoughts? Brad, what what do you think? I agree. <laughs> <laughs> now this was not an abrupt onset, you guys. Remember, this is a person coming in with a continuous right-sided headache with stabbing pains on the right side, and then we did a visual field and went, oh my goodness, she's got this kind of incongruous thing. Just have mass. Where? Like a, in the right parietal lobe. But you she has like a pituitary mass around the TCA. So does she? Could be, huh? Could it be pituitary? Why? Why do you say pituitary? Because you've got a lot of crossing fibers there, so you could get it. Depending on where it's compressing, you could get a pattern that's incongruous like that. You can get a tract lesion with a, uh, with a pituitary uh, compression, and that's exactly what she had. So, so she's got a mass in her pituitary that is compressing the posterior aspect of the pituitary, giving her an incongruous. Now, I'm telling you this case for several reasons. The first reason is that you should know that any homonymous defect could come from the pituitary. And this is on old caps all the time. They love this question. They love to give you a homonymous, incongruous like thing and then have you try to pick parietal lobe when it actually could be pituitary or chiasmal. Okay, so they love doing that. Usually they add, throw in an REPD to tell you that it's a tract lesion um, to give you a clue. But so, and I'm, I also am giving you this because pituitary tumors can cause eye pain and, uh, and give you these kinds of trigeminal autonomic cephalgias. So the phenotype of this headache, I treated her with endomethacin and her headache went away. The phenotype of her headache, I treated the phenotype of the headache and the headache went away, but it still didn't take away her pituitary tumor, which was probably related to the, to the headache. So she had a pituitary adenoma. 80, uh, you know, 46% will get a chronic migraine or sunk or cluster or hemicranial continuum or primary stabbing headache in studies where they've looked at headache and pituitary tumors. So, and these are people coming into your clinic all the time, not every day, but, <laughs> but, the, but you're not, it's, this is not going to be rare. If you're in general practice, you should at least remember, you know, you see somebody with the, that tack, you, you want to be thinking about it. Um, and then this is another study of audit, you know, the cranial autonomic symptoms associated with pituitary tumors. Uh, this hemicrania continua in this series was up to 20%. So we treated with endomethacin, then we took out her pituitary tumor, and then her headache came back, and I gave her endomethacin periodically. Okay, so this is a woman, let's see, how much time do I have? Uh, this is a woman, uh, who has a family history of migraine, and then she's had slowly developed increased headaches, most cr uh, chronic daily headache with no lighter sound sensitivity, no nausea. Some of the severe ones are positional and she has to lie down. Her pain is around her eyes and behind her eyes and she came in saying, I think it's something to do with my eyes. Her neuro exam is normal. She was just married, she had a baby six months before. She's trying to go to law school and this is her imaging and she was diagnosed in Boston as a Chiari malformation. <clears throat> is this a Chiari? We just talked about this yesterday. We had, had one of these. Huh? We had one of these that thought they had a Chiari and it's... Right, and is this a Chiari? No. What, why do you say no? He it said no. Like the the posterior fossa of the cerebellum is it sinking down. Okay, so there is tonsillar topia. But she's got a plump pituitary. Well, she's a young person, just had a baby. But she's lost her part of her ambient cistern around her midbrain. And when I saw the things that tipped me off was this ambient cistern is usually white all the way around. And the other thing that tipped me off is 
the pons. This, the pons is usually a nice little belly. You know, it's kind of got a little round belly and it's kind of flattened. And when you see a flattened pons, what should you be thinking of? Decreased intracranial pressure. Decreased intracranial pressure. Yeah. So uh, this is one year later when I finally <laughs> did see her myself. And she'd gone from one year, she'd gone from that, from the, that scan to this scan, looking like she's going to herniate. So that's a, a year before I saw her. And then when I saw her, she looked like this. And, uh, she had an epidural with her pregnancy, or no? So she'd had an epidural with her, um, but you know sometimes the dura gets a little nicked, and she had intracranial hypotension, yeah. and uh, you know you. Uh, yeah. All right, this I want to make sure we cover this case. This is a guy referred for anisocoria. So this is a guy, 37 years old. He's had long-standing migraine family history. Blah blah blah. And during his his headache, he notes severe anisocoria during the headache. Um, and this one, these are two different headaches. Both times his right pupil seemed to dilate. Um, and then when he's headache free, he looks like this. So this one, okay, benign episodic madriasis. But I wanted to show you how dramatic these can be. This one from the literature, where these pupils can be humongo. They usually work. They usually, can, you can get them to work, but they can be really big. And just to, be aware that this can occur. It usually switch sides, but it can always be on one side. Um, why do people get it? People wonder if it's a parasympathetic deficiency or a sympathetic overaction. Nobody really knows for sure. And um, okay, this is the last one, and then we'll talk about the quiz. 45 year old with brief eye pain, lasts 25 to 30 seconds, 50 attacks a day, slight ptosis in the right eye. His eye exam is normal, his neuro exam is normal. And, um, and he's got sunked. Um, and these are really not common, because I've only seen like maybe three in my to whole career, but it's one that you're gonna get tested on. It's even in your focal points, right? Mm -hmm. So they test you on it, so. Um, okay, oh darn, I wanna show you these two too, okay. <laughs> um, this one's a, a 24 year old with severe pain with, on the right eye and she has a history of rheumatoid arthritis. She's got a quiet eye, normal eye exam, and, um, but it's, but, and it's especially worse when looking down. Anybody have a thought about that one? Trochleitis, okay, trochleitis. Severe pain, 75 year old with rheumatoid arthritis, normal eye exam, eye quiet, normal eye exam except for some mild cervical spasm. Any thoughts about this one? Referred pain from the neck. Pardon? Referred pain from neck, from neck muscle. From her <laughs> cervical spasm, could be. Is this somebody, would you uh, just say, okay, it's your cervical spasm, go no, get some physical no. therapy? Yeah. An 84 year old woman with pain yeah, no. in her eye. No. I, I don't think so. Maybe that's not. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I don't think so. <laughs> I think you're going to work it up. A cer a cervical spasm is very common and, and yeah. ends up being a wastebasket. But this lady actually had been to several ophthalmologists and neurologists, and nobody went and looked at her odontoid that was compressing her cervical, upper cervical. They get panis, and this huge panis just pushes on the uh, a spinal nucleus of five, which gives you eye pain. And she came in with eye pain. That was to like three ophthalmologists, three neurologists, and then they just forgot to look at her. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, we got to go through the quiz. The dura is innervated by the upper cervical nerves, true or false? False. False. I, you know, false. A man has pain over his right eye that lasts 45 minutes. He has tearing rhinorrhea on the right side. His clinical diagnosis is most consistent with? Close. The next step is oxygen, MRCT, cocaine. <laughs> MR? You can give them oxygen, but you got to do yeah. an MR. They can give them oxygen first. The next step. And then, and then oxygen. Yeah, while they have oxygen in their nose. Second step. All right. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But he needs an MR. I want you to, I, you see a tack, they need an MR. Okay? They don't need 20 MRs. If they had an MR, that's all they need. They don't need 20. They don't need to come into my office with 20 CDs. Okay? They just need one. 
to any Okay, the headache in this case would be responsive to endomethacin, true or false? False. Good. A dilated pupil associated with migraine could be? All right. What does SUNK stand for? Sure. Stealing lateral neuralgia with tonsil injection. The average duration is? Two to ten. What are the three questions to ask to diagnose migraine? Photophobia. vomiting affecting Wait a minute. Photophobia? Nausea? Nausea? activity. And severe? And moderate to severe pain. Those are the three key questions in ID migraine. If you only have one second to do a migraine history, you ask, does this disable you or keep you from doing whatever you want to do at, or moderate to severe? Do you have photophobia and do you have nausea? And if they have two out of the three, it's migraine, if, as long as it's not something else. <laughs> That's the <a> great thing about it. It's making sure it's not something else, right? Yeah. That's the part that you always have to think about, even though most of it's migraine. Okay, name the nerve that innervates the dura. Okay, trigeminal is not good enough. It has to be either V1, and, and if anybody gets the actual nerve that does this, then they get an even extra point. The recurrent nerve of? Nobody Rossi. knows this. Recurrent nerve of Arnold. <laughs> well, that's why it was extra credit. I mean, I'm going to give you credit if you got a trigeminal first division. You can't just say trigeminal, though, because it's the first division, and that's the key about why the eye is the center of attention for all weird stuff. Because, in pain, it's because it's that first division of five that innervates the eye. And so that's why all pain leads to the eye in the trigeminal nerve. Okay. All right, so if you just turn, either turn it in or give me your scores, just turn in your papers, it's all you have to do. And then I'll give you credit. And if your name is at the top, Nerve of Arnold. Two to ten seconds. Recurrent nerve of Arnold. Yeah. Good. It's, it's been thought. It's been forgotten. And it's a. Oh, Did Arnold? Maybe we need to it? rename it. Huh? Rename it in the literature so it doesn't be forgotten. Maybe. That, I, I wouldn't be surprised yeah. at all. It's probably Arnold. It's probably the same. Okay. Arnold. So now. Did this work for you? Yeah, yeah this is awesome. Great. This yeah, is great. Awesome. This is what you're talking about, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I am lecturing so you next week. I am going to give a lecture because it's my troubling thirds. I've gone all across universities of the United States to ophthalmology departments and given this lecture. And for some reason, every time I've given it in this room, this stupid thing didn't work. So this is my like third or fourth attempt to try to give this lecture to you guys because I want it on core so that next year when we do third nerve, we can just watch the lecture and then do cases like this. But, but I need to do one of these, so you're gonna get a lecture. Okay. But it is one that I've given to a lot of other departments, so. Thank you. Yeah.